Hello, my name is Amish Doshi. I'm a neuroradiologist at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. I'll be speaking about postoperative spine imaging. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk are re reviewing various types of cervical and lumbar fusion surgeries, discussing imaging of the postoperative spine, defining fusion and non-fusion and reviewing their associated imaging findings, and finally removing, reviewing imaging features of postoperative spinal surgery uh, complications. Spine fusion uh, has significantly increased over, over the years. Um, between 1993 and 2001, uh, there was a substantially increased uh, number of fusions performed, cervical infusion, fusions by uh, approximately 400%, and lumbar fusions have uh, were increased during that time frame over 350%. So therefore, postoperative imaging is important really in assessing immediate complications and integrity of the surgical construct. And in addition, it allows for hardware assessment for recurrent or new symptoms. Cervical spine fusion indications include discogenic pain, nerve root compression, spinal cord compression, trauma, and tumor resection. These are tend to be performed either by an anterior or posterior approach. The anterior approach involves removal of the disc, typically with some level of fusion, and these can be performed with, with or without corpectomy, otherwise, remo otherwise known as removal of the vertebral body. Posterior approach typically involves a laminectomy or removal of the lamina, or a laminoplasty, and these tend to be associated with some level of fusion. A combined approach, um, which includes both the anterior and posterior, is typically termed a 360-degree approach. Here's an example on the left of a single-level anterior cervical disc fusion, where there has been a discectomy and a fusion across this disc space with an anterior plate and vertebral body screws. And here's an example of a multi-level um, anterior cervical disc uh, discectomy and fusion, where the discs have been removed, implants have been placed, and a plate is seen spanning, spanning multiple levels with these vertebral uh, screws. Once the disc is removed, an interbody fusion plug or cervical cage is placed. These tend to be cylindrical implant, implants with holes in the middle. These can be titanium or these peak implants. Peak implants tend to have a high rate of fusion, about 92 to 100% has been reported. These are filled. Both of these can be filled with uh, bone graft material. Um, it can either be autologous or allograft material. And these tend to be placed anteriorly within the disc to try to mimic, the to try to create that normal cervical lordosis when cervical fusion is performed. Another type of cervical fusion that can be performed if there's multi-level disease is a corpectomy with a fibular strut graft or titanium mesh cage. And you can see in this example, there's a multi-level disc disease due to, um, due to disc osteophyte complex. There's severe spinal canal stenosis here. And this patient underwent multi-level corpectomy uh, with placement of a fibular strut graft. Within the graft is bone graft material. And you can see, again, a plate spanning these levels with vertebral screws. And this is what it looks like on the coronal image here. Here's an example of a titanium mesh cage. Um, again, a corpectomy was performed. This cage is placed. Within the cage is bone graft material. You can see that centrally. Also on the axial image, you can see bone graft material. You can see the streak artifact from the metallic um, titanium uh, cage and as well as an anterior plate. Posterior cervical fusion includes laminectomy infusion and laminoplasty. Laminectomy infusion is where there's decompression or removal uh, due, to, due to removal of the lamina, complete removal of the lamina, and placement of screws to, uh, to, create, to result in fusion. Um, and these screws are typically lateral mass screws um, uh, and or pedicle uh, screws um, resulting in fixation. Laminoplasty is, uh, is when the lamina, the hemilaminectomy is performed, the contralateral lamina, a, um, a osteotomy is performed, the lamina is lifted, um, and a metallic construct um, is, uh, is placed to mimic the contralateral, uh, the, the lamina that was removed. This allows for widening of the spinal canal. Um, in this case, without need for laminectomy and fusion. So it's an alternative to the laminectomy and fusion, and it's termed laminoplasty. Of note, if you just do a laminectomy alone, there's a higher rate of instability. You can see in this example, a laminectomy is performed in the severe cervical kyphosis. We'll show some additional examples when we talk about complications. Lumbar spinal fusion indications include spondylolisthesis, discogenic pain, nerve root compression, cauda equina compression, and stenosis. Multiple approaches for lumbar interbody fusion can be performed. 
You can have anterior or posterior approaches, transfer aminal approaches, um, as well as extreme lateral approaches or direct lateral where you're coming from the side of the abdomen to enter to, into, the, um, into the lumbar spine um, or, and disc space. Of note, we should talk about total disc replacement, um, as you'll see these on imaging occasionally. This is an alternative to cervical and lumbar fusion. It's better at maintaining the normal range of motion because it mimics uh, the, the disc. Um, and it also has been shown to decrease risk of adjacent segment degeneration. We'll talk about that entity um, in the complications portion of this talk. Here's an example on imaging of what a total disc replacement uh, appears like. Uh, this is in the cervical spine, um, and here's an example in the lumbar spine. Zero profile devices are low profile devices that function as both the spacer and the anterior cervical plate. So this is a this is a, the zero profile device. You can see this uh, pseudo anterior plate here with screws that go into the vertebral body, as in this example. And then you have the um, you have the spacer which enters into the disc space after the discectomy. The spacer can again be filled with uh, bone graft material. Uh, these do not protrude up, um, beyond the anterior margin of the disc space here, so they don't press on the spinal, uh, the, the soft tissues in that region as a uh, anterior plate would. This is important, particularly in the cervical spine, where a plate can uh, result in some compression or pressure on the esophagus. Uh, so this actually reduces that risk. These, uh, these zero-profile devices, in comparison to anterior cages and plate techniques, show equal, um, equal rates of fusion. Arthrodesis um, and pseudoarthrosis are two important entities, really the primary purpose of the, the surgeries. Arthrodesis is defined as fusion. It's complete bony union of the adjacent bones um, sufficiently to support the spine and avoid abnormal motion at, at, at that level. Pseudoarthrosis or non-union or non-fusion is when there's incomplete bony union that can lead to abnormal motion. It can lead to migration or angulation of the grafts. And it can also cause impingement of the neuronal or neural structures. Clinically, a patients who have non-union can, can have pain, instability, and neurological sequela. Arthrodesis uh, or fusion factors. Um, it's important to note that uh, fusion may require months or years to achieve maximum bony fusion. Usually, we see some level of fusion within 6 to 12 months. There are multiple factors that contribute to how rapid and successful complete bony fusion is. This is the type of bone graft substrates that's utilized, uh, immobilization of the region being fused. Factors that can predispose to pseudoarthrosis or non-fusion include excessive motion or trauma at the operated level. This can include smoking, diabetes, malnutrition, steroid use, and osteoporosis. So in cervical fusion, fusion rates tend to be highest for a single level ACDF. You can see the rates can be 95 to 100% in one level. As you increase the number of levels that um, are operated on, the fusion rates do decrease. Um, plating, however, has shown to increase fusion rates. That's therefore, for a majority of ACDFs, you'll, you'll note, you'll see plates that are associated with this as it does increase the fusion rates. Um, fusion rates for Corpectomies that are um, that require titanium mesh cage and fibular strut grafts are similar, and they can be uh, fusion rates can be up to ninety to one hundred percent as reported. In lumbar fusion, fusion rates for lumbar uh, different types of lumbar fusions with autograft and allograft can approach ninety percent. Um, you can see that in this graph here, it's really a range of eighty to ninety percent. The rate of pseudoarthrosis varies significantly for one, uh, single and two-level posterior approaches. There's a wide range reported in the literature. It's important to note that lumbar fusions um, can be performed with recombinant bone morphogenic protein, um, which is a protein that results in induction of bone and cartilage formation. The FDA approved this for use in anterior lumbar interbody fusions in 2002, and it is an off-label use for other lumbar fusions, so you will see it. Known complication of this um, bone morphogenic or BMP, uh, pro this bone morphogenic protein is uh, the formation of ectopic bone formation, um, and therefore it's not used in cervical procedures. But you can see that the lumbar um, inner body fusion rates um, with a BMP tend to be higher than without BMP, which, uh, which is in blue without and with in the gray section here.
Imaging is very helpful in assessing fusion status, particularly in the setting of clinical symptoms that suggest pseudoarthrosis, as we discussed before. So that's pain, some level of instability, um, or neurological sequela. It's important to know when the surgery was performed in relation to imaging. So timing is very important. And the reason for that is within six months of surgery, pseudoarthrosis should not be diagnosed. You have to give it some time before you can call it pseudoarthrosis. Symptomatic pseudoarthrosis usually is seen within six to nine months after surgery. And x-rays are often done initially. Um, and ten, most people do flexion and extension x-rays. However, the value of this is, is questionable because you may not actually see the um, non-fusion on x-rays. High-resolution CT with multiplanar reformats are preferred, but MRI can be used as well. So what are the signs of successful fusion? You can have continuity of bone density and bone trabecula across the inner space, minimal height loss at the operated level, less than three degrees of movement on flexion and extension, and presence of a sclerotic line between the graft and the vertebral bone otherwise known as bone remodeling. Signs of failed fusion include discontinuity in the bone density, motion at the surgical level on flexion and extension, hardware movement or migration and lucency, and very importantly, subsidence, where the device actually sinks into the vertebral body and it's associated with increased incidence of failed fusion. So here's some examples of um, arthrodesis or fusion. You can see clearly that there's bony bridging across the disc space in this example. On the MRI, you can see continuity of the marrow signal between the two vertebral bodies. Here's another example of fusion. You can see that this is there is a interbody cage here. Through the center of the cage and laterally, there's clear bony fusion. And you can see that as well um, on the uh, sagittal image here. Uh, this is an example both on CT and MRI. You can see uh, a bony um, density across the disc space here. On the MRI, you can clearly see that there is obscuration of the margin between the cortex and the uh, bone graft material here. So there's clearly a con uh, cont continuity of marrow signal between the two vertebrae along the disc space here suggesting fusion. Here's another example where um, where we see the on the um, on the sagittal you can see clearly that there's bony bridging within the actual um, uh, spacer. When you look lateral to the spacer, you don't see significant bony bridging. If you look at the coronal, there's clearly bony bridging centrally but not laterally. This would be considered fusion. Here's an example of lumbar, multi-level, posterior lumbar interbody fusion and posterior lumbar fusion. You can see that there is continuity of bone across the disc space at these levels. If you look more laterally on the sagittal images to really evaluate the facets, you can see that there's fusion along the facet joints as well. So this implies that there's fusion both um, at the level of the disc spaces and as the level of the facet joints. So moving on to pseudoarthrosis, here's an example of a patient who was operated in June of 2014. You can see that, uh, so the, sorry, the MRI is performed in June of 2014. You can see a disc, ligamentous changing, severe canal stenosis. And in August of 2014, this patient was operated on. You can see that there is a um, single level ACDF. You can see the cervical cage or inner body fusion here. Um, and then on follow-up in June of 2015, um, almost a year later, uh, you can see that there is no bony bridging. You can actually see lucency between the two vertebral bodies along the um, inner body um, graft uh, without uh, direct fusion, and you can see lucency around the graft. Here's an ex another example of pseudoarthrosis. Um, uh, this is a patient who uh, was operated in May of 2014, single level ACDF, August 2014. Um, you can see that there's lucency really along the um, margins of the interbody plug here. Um, and then you can see slowly that there's breakdown and lucency actually forming around the actual uh, vertebral body screws. You can actually see some settling of the spine here. Eventually, there is um, significant lucency, a collapse of the actual uh, the graft and the, um, and the, the construct. Finally, the patient required posterior fusion to stabilize this, uh, this level of instability.
Here's an example of pseudoarthrosis and subsidence. Um, so in this example, you can see clearly that the graft is being pushed out um, along the disc space. The plate is being pushed anteriorly. When we look at the coronal and the um, and the axial images, you can see clearly lucency. So this is where the actual uh, the graft is being pushed into the vertebral body, and there's clearly a failure of fusion across the graft. Another example of subsidence here, you can see in this patient that two, um, two levels were, um, the multi-level uh, lumbar fusion was performed. Um, on the CT examination, you can see good bony bridging at this level. And here you can actually see that there's some lucency. There's not clear bony bridging. Clearly on the sagittal, you can see that the, the, um, the interbody spacer is being pushed into the vertebral body here, uh, consistent with subsidence. Here's, uh, here's an example of arthrodesis after posterior lumbar interbody fusion. Um, you can see that you know there is a graft material here. Um, the, there's some screws here. Um, and there's really, a, in this, this example here, there's not really direct fusion um, of this disc space. Now you can see posteriorly this patient was not fused. Because the lack of fusion, the patient underwent fusion posteriorly and ultimately um, when uh, on follow-up, uh, because of the decrease in motion at that level, the patient ultimately underwent fusion at the uh, L5-S1 uh, level. Here's an example of uh, failure fusion eventually resulting in motion. You can see that, again, there's no fusion across the L5-S1 disc space, and this tends to, tends to create motion. So this motion resulted in loosening of the screw here. You can actually see lucency on the sagittal image here around the screw, which is confirmed in the coronal. Typically, you should see no lucency, as in this example here and here. You can clearly see that there's lucency around the screw here and some lucency around the screw here at L5. This is consistent with hardware loosening. And you can see that there's no bony bridging across that disc space. Here's a patient who underwent um, uh, two surgeries. Uh, the, the patient initially had a um, lumbar interbody fusion and bone morphogenic protein uh, was placed in the, inside the disc space. And you can see here that this patient underwent a fusion later, but along where the bone morphogenic protein, you see clear, robust fusion, bony bridging across this disc space. Uh, here's an example of bone morphogenic protein placed with heterotopic bone formation. Uh, you can see this patient actually has a pars interarticularis defect here with a little bit of um, spondylolisthesis. Ultimately, went on fusion, and they did receive, they did place some bone morphogenic protein um, in the spacer, and you can actually see some some um, heterotopic bone formation occurring here. Now, this can cause symptoms because of significant narrowing. This can go into the neural foramina and spinal canal. In this case, this caused significant foraminal stenosis and pressure on the nerve root, um, and this patient had to be um, reoperated on. So moving on to complications, most serious adverse complications of spine fusion are rare, and they include death, cardiac arrest, pulmonary embolus, and um, cerebrovascular events. Um, imaging is important to identify complications related to spine instrumentation or injury to the soft tissues, vascular structure, spinal cord, and canal. And you may need to use some um, metal artifact reduction techniques or um, different types of imaging techniques to better visualize soft tissue and canal structures. So here's a list of um, multiple different complications, some of which we'll go through. Um, but to note, serious adverse complications of spinal fusions are rare. They're less than 1%. So here's uh, an example of hardware um, or graft failure. Um, and this is, uh, this is an example of both an anterior and posterior fusion. Um, this is a patient who had fracturing of the vertebral screws. You can see actually both on the axial and the sagittal image here. And if you look at the fibular struct graft here, you can see good fusion along the inferior aspect of the um, of the uh, of the um, corpectomy. Along the superior aspect, you actually see lucency here. So this is a patient who had some level of pseudoarthrosis and ultimately had some motion, which resulted in fracturing of this this uh, the, these screws. Ultimately, the patient underwent a surgery with posterior fusion to secure this in place and decrease uh, or to reduce the instability. Here there's not, here's another example um, where a patient had a um, discitis osteomyelitis, ultimately uh, underwent a corpectomy for treatment and with the fibular struct graft, which was uh, um, placed. 
ultimately, you could see that the the um, plate was pushed uh, ventrally or anteriorly uh, away from the vertebral body on follow up imaging, um, and ultimately required um, surgery and posterior fusion. Uh, here's an, another example of where the uh, the the fusion failed, and you can see lucency around the screws here and here, a little bit of lucency here, um, and this is consistent with hardware loosening um, from uh, failure of fusion. Malpositioning of hardware is another important uh, complication to be aware of. Um, certainly, you want to assess um, where all the screws are, if they're appropriately located. You can see this right pedicle screw is in its uh, normal course. Um, it's within the pedicle. Um, along the margins um, of the uh, uh, of the lateral aspect of the uh, of the pedicle wall here, and um, along the lateral aspect of the vertebral body, you can see um, alternatively on the left side, this is actually penetrating more medially um, into the medial aspect of the vertebral body, and actually um, courses along the lateral aspect of the spinal canal because it has penetrated the vertebral the pedicle. Um, on the coronal, this is much better uh, um, assessed, so multiplanar reformats are important here. You can see the scr screw here is displaced medially um, within the spinal canal. Compression fractures can occur after surgery. Um, as in this case, you can see that this is after surgery. Um, the vertebral body has um, a relatively normal height. Um, a uh, patient presented with pain, you can see that there is a compression deformity here on follow-up CT. You can see there's a new compression fracture. This patient can, was treated with vertebroplasty um, and improved. Uh, here's another example. You can see that uh, along the superior aspect of the of the um, of the surgery, that there is ultimately some uh, collapse of the superior margin of the vertebral body height. The patient actually had pain, um, and you can see. On this video here where the uh, vertebral plastic was performed, you can see that the bone curette is ab actually able to move the screw. So there's motion at the screw, there's lucency around the screw, um, and ultimately the patient uh, received a vertebral plastic um, and a cement injection uh, to, to stabilize this fracture. Particle disease um, is a very rare event. It's been reported in the literature. It's an osteolysis due to cellular response to particles um, from wear um, and corrosion, and these can be seen with total displacement. Again, these are rarely involved, but in this example, you can see a total displacement as I previously showed you, and um, you can see significant collapse with uh, various hyperdense uh, material within the vertebral body. Um, on CT, uh, this is what this looks like. You can actually have migration of these these uh, these little met metallic particles. Um, within the vertebral body, ultimately incites an inflammatory res res uh, response and causes osteolysis, uh, osteolysis uh, with these metal, metal uh, shavings um, being, um, uh, can, which can migrate into various areas um, around, the, uh, around the construct. Infection can be acute um, or delayed. Um, the incidence is about 2 to 6%. Of note, it's important to look at CRP and ESR. Um, they both should be increased. If it's normal, infection is not very likely. This is demonstrates a greater than 90% sensitivity, um, but has a low specificity. Um, technetium uh, um, bone scans can be performed with high sensitivity. If you combine them with gallium citrate scans, you can increase your specificity for these infections. Here's an example. You can clearly see that some destructive changes at um, L4-5. Um, this patient ultimately um, underwent uh, significant erosive changes on the uh, construct above, uh, on the uh, level above, um, with sclerosis, sclerotic changes. So you can see this kind of diminished um, osteolytic change within the vertebral body. You can see lucency around the screw, um, hyperdensity in the body, um, and collapse of the multiple levels here. On the MRI, you can actually see some hyperintense signal. Um, fluid uh, along that uh, cavity, um, and you may see significant enhancement, paraspinal enhancement as well um, from phlegmatous changes or abscess. Adjacent level disc disease um, or adjacent segment degeneration can occur, and this is defined as accelerated degenerative disc disease at the level that is next to or adjacent to the operative site. It's due to an increase in biomechanical load due to fusion, 
So essentially, you fuse several levels, and the level above or below it can undergo further degeneration. Here's the example. Here you can see that the, there's a multi-level fusion, and eventually there's more motion at this segment because the rest of the levels are fused. You can see that this resulted in vacuum dysphenomenon, further subluxation, um, and plate sclerosis. So there's advanced degeneration that is a result of this fusion. 50% of these can be symptomatic and it can require extension or fusion of the decompression. Here's another example in 2014, um, the patient had a multi-level ACDF. You can see some arthritic changes at this level here. You can see that they've significantly progressed um, in 2016 um, uh, um, due to the adjacent um, level disease. Here is another example. This patient had a laminectomy, you can see in 2012, um, multi-level disc disease, you can see that there's a big disc here. So this patient was operated on. You can see that in 2015, the disc was removed. The laminectomy when it was performed, there was a fusion. You can actually see the susceptibility from the hardware here. Um, but what happens here is that the uh, level above continues to um, develop degeneration. And you can see that the disc bulge is formed, ligamentous changes, and now there's significant uh, canal stenosis, which was previously not there. We showed this example previously. Um, this is a patient again who um, had a multi-level laminectomy um, and no fusion. So these patients can develop cervical kyphosis, an important thing to mention. Um, again, here's another patient who had, um, had a uh, fusion, um, ultimately had a laminectomy without um, posterior fusion and underwent a focal kyphosis. You can see the laminectomy um, on this image on the right. Failed back surgery syndrome, otherwise termed post-laminectomy syndrome, is persistent or recurrent pain after lumbar surgery. There are many causes, including recurrent disc herniation, epidural fibrosis, spinal stenosis, arachnoiditis, as well as wrong level surgery. Contrast enhancement is particularly helpful, um, and it can be used to differentiate disc, recurrent disc, from scar. Here's an example of that. Um, this is a patient who has uh, uh, what looks like a significant disc bulge, uh, disc herniation. Um, after laminectomy, you can see evidence of uh, post-surgical changes here. And on the post-contrast, you see peripheral enhancement. So this is consistent with the disc. Again, you can see that kind of heterogeneous enhancement within the soft tissue is consistent with post-surgical changes. Here, there's another example. Um, the T1 shows some soft tissue fullness along the laminectomy site and laterally. On the T2, you can see this kind of uh, protrusion here. It looks like there's a disc protrusion, so this could be a recurrent disc, but we have contrast, and you can clearly see this area um, that's protruding out is actually enhancing. So this is consistent with um, epidural uh, scar or fibrosis. Of note, it's important to, to, to be aware that um, disc can enhance, particularly if you do delayed imaging. This is a patient who had a, a contrast injection, but the post-contrast images were uh, were delayed by about 20 minutes. You can see again that this is um, what looks like a disc herniation. Now you can see continuity of the disc here on the T2-weighted image um, from the native disc. Um, so this is pretty, pretty clearly a disc um, protrusion. On the post-contrast images though, because it was a delayed um, imaging, you can actually see enhancement. So it is important to note that timing is important. So if you uh, image immediately, disc should not enhance, but if you uh, wait, then the, the disc can enhance. Inadvertent durotomy or CSF leak can result um, from surgery. These can cause positional headaches, most resolve within four weeks. These can usually be treated with lumbar, brain, lumbar drain to aid in, in closure. If you're not sure if the collection is a post opera collection or CSF, you can send the fluid for beta 2 transferrin, um, which is only found in CSF and perilymph. A CT myelogram or indium 111 scan can also be performed for occult leaks. So here's an example of a patient who had a laminectomy. You have this big collection here. Uh, we weren't 100% sure if this was connected um, and this was CSF containing or per surgical collection. When we did the myelogram, you can clearly see that contrast is spilling out into this collection here. So this was consistent with the CSF leak. Here's another example. You can clearly see a connection between the spinal canal and the, um, the thecal sac and this collection here, which is consistent with the, uh, with the CSF leak.
Gelfomoma um, uh, is, uh, is a term used uh, for um, gel foam re resulting in significant mass effect on the spinal canal after surgery. It's important to know that gel foam is a hemostatic agent that can be used to control um, bleeding, um, but it can also expand to 200% of its initial volume. So typically surgeons will soak this in saline for several minutes um, prior to insertion. However, you can still get significant enlargement after placement of the gel foam. And here's an example um, on the T2-weighted image of this hyperintense structure that's, um, that's uh, really causing severe mass effect upon the spinal cord and severe canal stenosis. Um, and this ended up being um, a gel foam that was placed. The patient went back to the OR and this was removed. But the differential for this also includes hematoma and postoperative fluid collection. Vascular injury um, is an important thing to identify. You can see in this patient here, um, these lateral mass screws um, look pretty good on the uh, on one side, but on the contralateral side, you can see that this is actually uh, approaching the transverse foramen where the uh, vertebral body sits. On the axial, you can clearly see that this is um, entering the transverse foramen. If you see this, um, certainly mention it, and you can request a CT angiogram um, for evaluation of the uh, vertebral artery. Uh, this is a, um, a case from Dr. Tom Nadek. Um, you can see that this is an ACDF um, that was done, um, and this patient um, developed a pseudoaneurysm off of the vertebral artery um, uh, from, from the surgery, ultimately underwent a coiling to close off the aneurysm. Finally, uh, soft tissue injury can occur. Um, here's an ACDF um, and that, was, uh, that was performed in the cervical spine. Um, and ultimately, uh, this patient had a breakdown in the construct. Um, you can see this big um, kind of uh, collection uh, along the esophagus, um, and you can see that this actually migrated, this construct migrated into the esophagus, um, and, uh, and ultimately was, uh, was resulted in erosion of uh, the posterior wall of the esophagus. Um, so with that, um, the, you know, we've reviewed uh, common approaches to spine infusion, um, discuss imaging findings that we see in arthrodesis and pseudoarthrosis and how we identify those. And finally, we've reviewed a variety of possible complications that can be seen after spinal surgery. And with that, I thank you.